uh, <laughs> has uh, a long experience, especially in the detection of uh, expectation and detection of uh, gravitational wave signals. Uh, one of the most important, uh, in my opinion, results is the detection of uh, uh, the signal uh, for uh, that observed uh, in the, the 17, eh, 1917, uh, 07, 17, okay, uh, which was the first, uh, the first event that has been uh, has been associated to a government. Mm -hmm. uh, the result uh, obtained by, by Maurice, along with uh, uh, Massimo de Laval, was uh, uh, the fact that this event uh, could be a neutral star. So, the merging of neutral stars and uh, the possibility to see also this particular. Uh, uh, particular evidence of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the transition from, uh, from uh, the merging and the, uh, the, the observation of this event. This, I don't know if this is still under discussion, but what I know is that the, uh, uh, the software, the algorithms, uh, the, uh, the algorithms <laughs> that has been uh, uh, has been developed by Maurice are very sensitive, in my opinion, and uh, this is very important. I don't know how, why <laughs> the the people from uh, uh, from a gravitational wave. Uh, Interferometer don't use them because, in my opinion, uh, they uh, its algorithms are very more sensitive. Are really more sensitive. Anyway, in addition to the theoretical uh, background, the very strong theoretical background, uh, the advantage of of, uh, of Maurice is to have. Uh, a, a real capability to develop software and algorithms that increase the sensitivity of the uh, gravitational wave. We have also uh, uh, interferometers. We have also uh, developed something together <laughs> based on the stacks. Uh, let's, 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 let's start the talks. Let's start the talk. Start the talk. <laughs> it's like it's like a book. No, 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 that's very helpful. <laughs> it's a great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for this very kind uh, introduction. I think. Can I like this? I yeah. have to yeah. go like this. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So I don't need to say much about scientific opportunities to this group. I mean, the universe is right with all sorts of catastrophic events. From mergers to supernovae. And sometimes we know the random. Sometimes, of course, there's a key science question what is the random? Um, so, I am somewhat more specific to the current era of 04 and upcoming the Zoys mission, is uh, and motivated by uh, the observed double star merger 817, is what actually is the diversity of these mergers when you have something more than just two black holes, say one black hole in the star or two neutral stars, or you know, what have you. Um, because do all of them make a short GRD? Maybe, maybe not. Do all of them make a killer nova? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe all of them have some afterglow drama and gravitational waves. Again, so you have all these different possibilities that may depend on the precursor merger composition by type of star and also total mass. So, of course, right now it's an n equals one observation. So, but this will certainly play out in the future that we should be able to identify what kind of post merger drama uh, belongs to the actual progenitor binary. 
And then I would like to emphasize the key two central questions in, uh, in stellar mass type of high energy sources, which is, is it really the central engine and we can start or a black hole? And related, but not identical, is the energy extraction uh, by accretion or by spin down? And again, these are very non-trivial questions that have been put on the table by EM observation, but it seems that EM is not sufficient to give a definitive answer to these uh, pertinent questions that play out uh, both in uh, Coca Lab Supernova already in 1987A. We don't know what is the final answer to either one of these. And of course, for people who are interested in nuclear physics, you can ask, you know, does, do we learn anything about the equation of state of neutron stars from these dramatic? Uh, events. And there are different ways of going about it. Traditionally, what you find in the literature is that people focus on potentially immediate post merger high frequency gravitational radio emission, which is something we haven't observed yet, but that may be uh, uh, important quantitative information that may constrain, say, the radius uh, and hence the uh, equation of state if you take the mass of the projector into account. But alternatively, we will argue that the lifetime. Of the hypermassive neutron star that may be produced is another constraint that may be more accessible to observation, but in some sense, fulfilling the same role. And personally, I'm also very interested, <coughs> and many others, I think, is whether any of this will lead to new standard candles in measuring the Hubble parameter. And one of the central questions that I like to advertise is the question is the de Sitter state that is the promise of the future in Lambda CDN? Does it actually exist? That's a stability question, and that may already be addressed by uh, regional tension. Okay, so today we are at the beginning of the combined ENM gravitational wave observations, and the two events that stand out as the two main multi messenger events is the supernova 987A and uh, the double star merger 0817 with the GRB uh, 170817A. And interestingly, uh, ENM or even ENM and neutrino the detection in case of the supernova are not sufficient to you know, tell the full story. What is the actual central object that is responsible in this case for the explosion in 1987A? And likewise, what is the final remnant and hence what is the final uh, remnant that defines the central engine of the GRB in the merger case uh, is not answered conclusively by EMF. So that's the one of the main motivations to say, well, what if we include gravitational wave observational data in these events? Maybe then we can say more because, of course, gravitational wave observations or gravitational waves propagate quite nicely, are not hindered by any opacity issues that otherwise. Are obscuring our view when we use EM. So, what's the status? So, the, the status, you can of course, uh, introduce many topics, but the key topics that I focus on here are related to O, the O in a, you know, LIGO central laser, which is the electric gravitational wave observatory. And when you think of an observatory, you think of an unmodeled view of the sky, maybe in some selected parameter space, but at least without any bias. And <clears throat> that brings into view the question on search sensitivity that maybe you can normalize, say, to dedicated searches for selected events like mergers that we understand theoretically quite well. Um, and of course, event counts how many of uh, unmodeled events have we actually seen so far? And importantly, for ultimately uh, generating ENM gravitational wave surveys, what is the uh, statistics of the event, because ultimately we will be confronted with the problem of consistency in ENM statistics versus gravitational wave statistics on these strange events. And they're not automatically the same, because each, depth, each of them, of course, has their own selection effects. And you have to normalize properly to see if there is, for instance, uh, consistency in the number of GRBs that you expect from mergers. And the number of mergers that you actually observe. But to get to the true merger rate, you have to make a conversion for the fact that your detectors are always working. So, um, what is commonly advertised 
uh, in the literature, and this may be confusing to some, is that the surge sensitivity to unmodeled signals has a threshold of about uh, 6.5 solar mass squared. This comes from the study for, by LIGO O2. So you have to, of course, divide by vector roughly two when you translate this to O4. But given that the total mass energy of your dominant star merger is 2.7 solar mass, of course, it's not a very promising threshold to look for a model of the uh, And hence, the event count was uh, labeled as being zero. And then the individual detector duty cycle cycles is often advertised as about 70%. But you have to take this, uh, you have to go one step deeper if you ask what is actually the relevant duty cycle if you're interested in expecting accurate event rates for your mergers. That means, of course, you're looking at the state of the detector that is suitable for making a genuine high confidence level detection. So having the detector switch on is not enough. It also has to be working in the proper nominal detector performance range. And then, of course, uh, specific to gravitational wave observations, we need at least a confirmation in two detectors. Otherwise, you can't believe the signal. Okay, so that means that the actual effective duty cycle is actually a bit lower than 70%. So let's revisit this challenge uh, of a unmodeled uh, unbiased search for anything that may have happened during 0817. And this is the brief summary that uh, is something that's pretty conclusive. There was a double loop star merger with a total mass of about 2.7 solar mass, and there was a superior time delay of about 1.7 seconds, following which there was uh, the GRB. And associated with this event, of course, is this very famous Stephenova as well. Importantly, is that the total energy in electromagnetic radiation is about 0.5% of the solar mass in C squared. And that is not sufficient to make your calorimetric identification whether the central engine is a pure, is a uh, little star or a black hole. Those little stars can easily give you half of the same of M solar or C squared, which is called energy output. So, just like 1987A, EM observations, even including gravitational wave precursor signal, is not sufficient to identify the central engine of the GRB. And the GRB, of course, is listed here, the light curve uh, picked up by Fermi and much later. Uh, this has, of course, been this, uh, the data have been revisited uh, by many, including then the more late time radio emission and the identification of the jetic outflow. And because it's so nearby, people have been able to infer that the Lorentz factor of the jet is actually uh, now constrained to be about 70 and that the angle to the line of sight is about 20 degrees or something certainly, but it is not zero. We are really looking at the jet uh, on axis. And that will be important uh, later on in this call. Um, very uh, prescient in 2002, this was, of course, prior to the first detection of gravitational waves by LIGO. Uh, Cutler and Thorne advertised that if gravitational waves are detected from one or more GRB triggers, the waves will certainly reveal the physical nature of uh, these events. And that, of course, is uh, indeed where gravitational waves hold the greatest promise. And then just reiterating the key questions what is the compact object and what is the mechanism of energy extraction? So, <clears throat> What, uh, what can you say even before you start looking for a signal? Of course, there is such a thing as conservation of total energy. So if you imagine looking at energies in different energy channels, neutrinos, gravitational waves, electromagnetic radiation, all of that, of course, uh, must be less or equal than the total mass energy in the system. That's kind of like an open door, but it's actually relevant to this discussion. And so in particular for gravitational waves, gravitational wave emission but uh, it's always going to be less than 2.7 solar mass and C squared. That means that your threshold for detection has to be, of course, less than 2.7 solar mass and C squared for it to be a meaningful uh, search. Um, and then in this talk, I will have a, a systematic approach to this, uh, essentially centered around event timing. One of the things that there's a lot of advantages actually with working with event timing. One of 
Then being that the prior, of course, on any given time is a uniform, is uniform over your choice of observation. Uh, you know, you don't need to assume any Gaussian energy or whatever distribution. It's just a uniform distribution because things can happen anytime, anywhere in your instrument or in the sky, provided it's not much less than the whole time, of course. So that is very uh, nice in statistical analysis, then. And of course, you can combine event timing in different energy channels. Event time is a PNN or event time is a gravitational wave, depending on what is the actual evolution of the event that you're looking at. And we will argue that this will be very useful in uh, expecting a uh, probability of false alarm to address these questions. You know, is it uh, accretion powered? If it's accretion powered, in fact, you expect the central engine to be spinning up. Uh, if it's spin powered, you expect, of course, the central object to be spinning down. And uh, the distinction between a neutral star or a black hole is ultimately going to be through gravimetry in gravitational waves. If you get more energy out in gravitational waves associated with spin down than that a neutral star can give you, then you know that the neutral star is ruled out. And there are basically only two possibilities. I mean, you're not going to, going to expect a white dwarf to pop up out of the double to star market. It's either a neutral star or a black hole. So LIGO has put a great effort in, uh, of course, analyzing these data, the merger, but including studies of what happened following the merger. And there were two famous papers in 2017 that advertised that uh, we find no signal from the post-merger remnant. And it's a bit of a, it's a very informative identity plot that is central to these uh, works. You see that here because they show uh, noise, uh, detector noise, strain noise uh, graphs as a function of frequency uh, in different colors because you're looking at LIGO, Virgo, Geo, and uh, some four detectors physically. And then you see these dashed lines that indicate um, minimum energies. Uh, or, or upper bounds on, on anything that is below each dashed curve. So it goes from 1% to 10% to uh, 3.2 solar mass and C squared. And you can see that basically the little colored triangles and, and, and squares are all about uh, certainly the second and many of them about the third dashed line. That means those are where they effectively look in terms of uh, potential signals. But this is way above the noise curves of the detector. And of course, the actual merger was detected as a signal in the noise that we successfully were able to uh, extract by a match filter. So there is a huge discrepancy effectively in the unmodeled observation of uh, any known or unknown signal uh, versus the uh, sensitivity achieved by compact binary photos. And even more so, the threshold for long duration burst searches is uh, 6.51 in the techniques that they use. But of course, this is more than the total mass energy of the system. Okay, so this doesn't qualify by energy conservation as an observational result. So then you can ask, is there really no signal as is suggested by this uh, effort? And so let's look at it by a new analysis. So our first paper on this was published with together with Massimo Della Valle in 2019. And we find using our technique, uh, this spectrogram where you can clearly see that there is a, of course, first of all, I should say, this uses a fine symmetric method of observation. So if you see anything going up, there's an equal sensitivity to anything going down. Yeah, because by construction, our templates, this is match filtering, but our templates are fine symmetric. So if you believe the signal going up, you should believe in the signal going down because technically it's achieved by the same procedure. And <clears throat> of course, you can look at this in more detail, and you should, in the context of the associated light curve or gamma ray emission, which then will allow you to do very detailed fine uh, event timing analysis. And <clears throat> I'll discuss this uh, in my talk in several steps. But the most uh, pertinent uh, information we have is, of course, the gap, 1.7 seconds, and the duration of the GRB, which is about three seconds. But that's not all. 
because you can now ask what of course additionally is the, the starting time of the descending branch in this gravitational wave. So that's going to be a lot of information. You have a merger time of the double neutron stars, you have a start time of the gravitational wave of the descending branch, and you have the start time of the DRV. So this is really a open messenger event timing analysis. In fact, recently uh, in collaboration with my postdoc, Marina Pop Juliet, um, to be published in a paper together with uh, Lorenzo Amati to appear in FJ. We also uh, revisited this problem using plain FFT analysis. So you do the proper, you know, uh, down sampling and you use the proper whitening. Remarkably, even in FFT, you can see that there is a feature that appears false merger that is indeed the descending branch that otherwise is shown at much higher contrast in our butterfly and show them the technique. Of course, FFT is also a time symmetric. You know, because it has a constant frequency basis functions, you can flip the data to like in time and you'll get the same result. So it has to satisfy this objective of being a model independent observation. But uh, Fourier analysis, of course, has a limitation in that for any time varying signal that varies over some, you know, change in frequency delta f over some time scale tau, uh, you're going to be limited in tau according to the time frequency and sort of the relationship tau times delta is about one so you can't choose tau too large that means you're limited in the total number of periods that you can capture that otherwise you need to by the square root of n to increase your sensitivity by the match filtering procedure but obviously for the analysis is also a kind of match filter so what we did and we developed this earlier in 2014 uh, together with cristiano and uh, filippo to uh, analyzing uh, light curves of uh, uh, uh DRVs is what if you not only choose uh, a template band that is dense in frequency, but also in dot f. Then if you imagine doing a data series extension, you can actually increase tau beyond tau delta f is one. So you get better sensitivity. And the result you can see here, we get a sensitivity that's about 10 times better at the highest frequency in a in time series analysis of uh, Bebosex light curves by a factor of about 10. That's a lot. Imagine then for uh, uh, posing this to gravitational wave analysis. Uh, we took this as a hint that this is perhaps a very promising technique to improve uh, sensitivity in uh, spectrograms of gravitational wave data. Now, very recently, we were able to give a much more detailed theoretical understanding of this. You can actually go through the algebra uh, based on Taylor series extensions, and you find that this technique, by including uh, dot f, gives you a gain in individual spectrograms by about 2.4. If you then merge the spectrograms, you get an additional square root of two. So ultimately, we gain a sensitivity over a uh, single detector at the key based spectrograms by a factor of about 3.12. Of course, in energy, that's a lot, that's a factor of nine. And in event detection probability, that's a factor of about 27. You can also think about how long does it take for the, the, the physical LIGO detector and Virgo to improve in sensitivity by a factor of two. It's about one decade. So a factor of two is actually quite useful. Okay, so I won't be able to show this in detail, but we, of course, have done calibration of sensitivity of our uh, technique by signal injection experiment. So, based on this, we can infer that the energy in the descending branch is about three and a half percent. So, what does that mean given that the frequency of gravitational waves associated with this is less uh, than 700 hertz? So, for any quadrupole emission, this means that. <clears throat> the associated spin frequency is 350 hertz or less. Now imagine setting up your favorite model for a neutron star, then this is a very tall order for uh, even for a hypermassive neutron star or say 2.5 solar massive. Essentially you find that it falls short in spin energy by a factor of about four. I mean, we just don't see how a neutron star can provide that energy that we infer in gravitational wave. Okay, that of course means that the only other alternative is a 
rapidly rotating black hole providing that energy. So uh, going further now in our event timing analysis, you can of course zoom in, you have your merger, you have your star time of the gravitational wave emission, and you have your star time of your GRB. Of course, the gravitational wave emission is naturally associated with the central engine and better starts before the GRB and after the merger. So you have an a priori causality constraint that this star time TS is between the two, meaning in an interval of length 1.7 seconds. If we do a detailed analysis, um, basically using sort of the time, time slides, of course, we have a single observation, but still you would like to infer the uncertainty associated with the noise. You can do that actually by choosing very small time slides and then repeating your entire analysis and, and, and in estimating that TS, you get a PDF of TS. Mm -hmm. So this is a one exaplot calculation, but the result is worth it because now you're looking at a genuine PDF of the star time <clears throat> you'll find that it is well within the 1.7 uh, second gap, and you get an estimate at 0.92 plus or minus 0.08 seconds. This is far more accurate than you can get from EM studies, say on the lifetime of the hypermassive neutral star associated with the Kiranova. So, uh, but most significantly, this uh, star time is in the gap. So it satisfies causality. And if you were to then, you can then immediately infer a probability of false alarm given the uniform prior of TS under the null no hypothesis, you just divide 1.7 seconds by your final observation. Now, more recently, in the last two years, we asked ourselves, uh, or we posed ourselves the challenge, and you also see the signal individually in H1L1. So instead of the factor of, you know, advantage of 3.1, that I mentioned earlier, you're going back to a factor of two. So these are less uh, extreme in contrast, but now you have, you're have you looking at spectrograms of the individual detectors, and you can then of course ask the natural question, is, is anything you infer by parameter estimation consistent between the two? It better be, because if it's a gravitational wave signal, it should show up exactly the same in both detectors. Okay, so we did a full independent H1L1 analysis, including then the star time uh, and many more parameters, including the time scale of decay of the descending branch. And we find uh, this result, you know, in one of them, this is actually what you're looking at is one slide, one set of images out of 320. Okay, we did many, many variations in uh, the template bank. And we took a stride in expecting data to make images, otherwise you would see too many points. Um, this is part of the procedure in generating a PDF. So this is one representative sample. And you see that the, the uh, start time is uh, strikingly the same. Of course, we have a slightly larger uncertainty in the start time than you would have in natural patch filtering with complex binary coalescence. Our uncertainty is about 20 milliseconds. Um, but you see that these uh, star times are indeed the same uh, of the descending branch in both detectors, and also the time scale of uh, descent. It's about two seconds in both detectors. So these are statistically consistent. There's an additional two parameters, start frequency and time frequency, that uh, you cannot save on the disk. Again, this is an exaplot calculation. Uh, but uh, all of these parameters are uh, representative for the maxima and the in the uh, in the data over four parameters, so we can expect a PDF for each of them as before, and then to check consistency, we just do a cross correlation between the two PDFs, and we ask is then the result consistent with the delta t between the two p zero. So you see that here, vertically, I plotted here in blue and red the two PDFs, and then you just cross correlate them. And horizontally in the lower panel, you see <clears throat> that the cross correlation has a maximum very clearly that delta t is zero. So they see the same star time as you would expect. So, of course, something you should verify. And this, of course, gives you a uh, probability of false alarm in its own right. Imagine we have two uniform distributions of star times for H1 and L1, and what's the probability that they end up in exactly the same, uh, exactly the same value? Of course, actually, it's in two dimensions because there is also the tau as the time scale of decay. It's kind of like throwing a dice in a casino on a large table, and the dice lands on two tables at exactly the same spot in two dimensions. 
Okay, that carries a significant P of A. Here we only looked at the, uh, in this calculation, the P of A associated with the star time. So it's actually very much of a conservative estimate. But the main point here is to appreciate that <clears throat> if you look at the mean value that I showed earlier, when you merge spectrograms, you're effectively you know, taking the mean value. And then by looking at consistency, you're looking at mean and, and time difference. Of course, that is the result of the rotation of pi over four of the H1 and L1 data. So that's a unitary transformation. Okay, so these PFAs are statistically completely independent. Um, so you can multiply them. The first one is an ordinary probability effect. Uh, you can multiply them. So if you get a decent, uh, but not shockingly high value of P of A for each of them, the combination actually is more than five sigma. It's about 5.5. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you get now a picture of the uh, merger sequence that uh, <coughs> we added to our paper on uh, you know the various time scales, frequencies, and energies, because it's a very complex process. Uh, it starts very clean, you know, just a merger of your gravitational waves. And then you form a happy massive neutral star with a lifetime of about 0.9 seconds that then flexes to a black hole and then it makes a DRV. But of course, a DRV you don't see immediately because there's the usual relativistic time delay that I'll mention in a second. Uh, so the gravitational waves are observed first. Um, and then about 0.8 seconds later, you see the GRV. But what is important is that if you look at the data in the electromagnetic window and the gravitational wave window, they are remarkably consistent. This is an a priori check, sort of a health check on this analysis. In the ENM, you find what people refer to as the wind time, so it's effectively the lifetime of the hypermassive neutron star producing uh, the uh, rich neutron wind output driven by NAD. Uh, radiation is about 0.92 plus or minus 0.3. And we find by the start time of the gravitational wave emission, a uh, lifetime of the hypermassive neutral star to be 0.92 plus or minus 0.08. If you look at the duration of the GRB, of course, this is well known from the actual GRB life curve, it's about three seconds. And we find a time scale of uh, descent in the gravitational wave signal of about the same, three seconds. So we find this uh, very encouraging that uh, we find it hard to imagine that all of this is by, by chance. So what are we looking at then in a more pictorial way, a uh, double into star merger that produces of course an SM in gravitational wave emission, SM in frequency in time uh, that initially produced hypermassive neutral star at a finite lifetime, it was apparently too heavy or uh, anyway, it was unstable. It then collapses, makes a black hole with some debris around it. And of course, once this is dressed up with magnetic fields, you can have a potential for strong interactions uh, that through which then the black hole, when it spins rapidly, can seriously spin up and heat up the surrounding core. If you heat up the surrounding core, it actually becomes unstable to uh, multiple mass moments. You can actually give a very detailed calculation on this. But of course, actually, m equals one in the torus is already enough to get an m equals two in the system. Maybe you actually do form m equals two in the torus alone. Uh, but anything uh, non systematic in the torus will make this very luminous gravitational wave that then, of course, will cause the black hole to spin down. And as it spins down, the most stable circle orbit expands, radius expands, and of course, you see a descending uh, branch in frequency. So that's the descending branch. So in this case, you see a little bit more energy in the descending branch than in the ascending branch. The ascending branch is about two and a half percent, but it's comparable. Um, as I was alluding to earlier, it's actually interesting now that you can do things you couldn't do before. If you combine EM and gravitational wave timing data, you can actually play with this formula. This is a very well known formula for, for the photospheric radius to be essentially the delta T between the birth of the central engine and the time you actually observe the GRV divided by one minus beta cosine theta in the usual interpretation of beta being B over C and cosine theta, theta being the angle to the line of sight. Um, in this particular case, as you may know from this study by Moody et al, we did not see the jet head on like a blazer. We actually saw it at some finite angle theta. So if you include that, 
then uh, so you look at this formula, uh, in, in, including this uh, this geometric effect. Uh, you find that the uh, photospheric radius is about 0.03 AU. This is remarkably consistent with many speculations earlier, but now you get it actually out of real data. You know, a few times 10 to the 12 centimeters. So where are we then? Uh, reality versus uh, to the question mark versus uh, actuality. So in our uh, approach, our special for detection is a few percent solar mass in square. That's why we see things related to the central engine of the GRB. And the event count then for an unmodeled search is one. And what about duty cycles? If you look at the um, how the, the, det the detectors behave, of course, it's, it's quite complicated. They are not exactly stationary. Uh, fortunately, a fair fraction of the time, they work really, really well, but not always. But what you really need for an unmodeled search, of course, is confirmation in two detectors. So you should insist that two detectors work really, really well. Okay, so that uh, means that you're not going to be having 100% observation of time. And if you do the statistics, which we did, and we define it such that there is an overlap within one sigma of the natural standard deviation in the spectrum as defined by Welsh, uh, if they overlap, we say, okay, they both work nominally at the same desired level of performance. Uh, you see that here, actually, in a review of the existing LIGO runs, starting from S5, that's in the middle of a long time ago, uh, up to uh, 03A, 03B, of course, we will assume it's now for 04. In the near future, you see it's, it's, there's not really a trend. You know, the performance varies tremendously uh, from run to run. Uh, of course, we are not party of the actual how the detectors are run, it's very complicated. Uh, and people are constantly, you know, considering uh, ways to improve it. Uh, but what is remarkable is that, say, O2 is one of the better ones. You, can, you might think it's O3B, but actually, O2 turns out to be the most consistent. Um, so the way we look at it very agnostically, because we are not detector people, it seems that O2 is sort of a model how you would like your machine to be run, and then you get a duty cycle effectively of about 20%, that both of them are working well within, uh, upon looking at time frames that are eight seconds long. So you also have to specify, of course, over which duration do you expect the detectors to work. That depends on your search. I mean, if you're looking for uh, other sources, maybe you would like to choose a different time scale. So it's time scale dependent because there's also the Poisson time scales in the statistics of detector performances. But eight seconds, of course, is something that's relevant to our searches. So effectively, up to OT, AOT, <clears throat> the maximum, uh, what we call detector yields relevant to unmodeled searches is about 20%. And that's important because if you want to convert what is actually observed to a true event rate, you need to have some sense of, you know, what's my down selection by uh, the true observational window in time. Okay, so I'm slowly coming to my conclusions, although it's several slides. So the main conclusion is that we make this detection of a non merger gravitational wave signal both in FFT, in fact, and also in. But the black match filtering at higher contrast um, of a signal that represents a spin down of a black hole uh, releasing about two and a half percent in gravitational waves. And importantly, for the interpretation of the lifetime of a hypermassive neutron star, uh, this happened at about 0.92 seconds after the merger. Um, so, what about the near future, uh, not only given 04, 05, but also emissions like the Zoids? Uh, of course, we would like to have more data points on lifetimes of hypermassive neutron stars. Right now, if you like, we only have one, but you know, one is better than zero. Um, we would like to close the gap between the ascending and descending branch of gravitational wave. And we would like to understand the central engine of four collapse supernovae. And of course, aim for consistent statistics in event rates in ENM and gravitational wave surveys. So that's quite a bit of homework. So this is just to highlight where we are with our uh, data points. 
our mini survey in some sense of with two data points, if you like, we are adding here 190425. Um, you know, there was no Tudonova observed, it was kind of heavy. So presumably there was no hypermensal infrastructure star formed. Um, the only positive one then is 0817. And, and there are many studies that suggest, like Luca and uh, Sagunski, that if you have a more massive hypermensal infrastructure star, it, it has a shorter lifetime. So that seems quite natural. But of course, we would like to see this in a graph. So we are very much looking forward to picking up another such event. Um, and what about uh, the differences in mergers that we briefly talked about before the talk? Well, there are all sorts of combinations you can imagine. Here we just looked at the combinations that involve at least one neutral star. Uh, you can imagine a new star, of course, with a neutral star or a, with a black hole. You can imagine a black hole being quite large, so that the neutral star is swallowed up in one shot. Or maybe you have neutral stars and white dwarf, uh, although that merger signal would, would not necessarily be in the range of uh, light or frequencies. Um, and then you can get all sorts of different combinations of afterglow drama. You know, you may or may not have a Theonova, you may or may not have a GRB, and you may or may not have uh, a um, gravitational wave descending branch. One thing I would like to highlight is this uh, suggestion that uh, perhaps, you know, the one shot swallowing up or starting a black hole may be uh, an FRB simply because it doesn't do much else. So let's hope it does something. Uh, the only leftover signal would be the strong radio burst of very short duration. So this is somewhat testable by these ENM gravitational wave observations because you would see an SN in chirp in gravitational wave, but you would see nothing else. No Pidanova, no GRD. And if somebody tells you, yes, but I did see an FRB, right at the moment, properly taking care of time delays, right at the moment of the merger, that would be pretty convincing that this is a, uh, a case where the little star is swallowed up in one shot as an engine for an FRB. So I'm closing the gap. Uh, actually, quite frequently when LIGO talks about post-merger gravitational wave emission, they, it's not always clearly um, stated, but they often refer to the immediate post-merger phase which refers to the gravitational wave emission from the hypermassive neutron star. And of course, that's a very important uh, target of our observation that also we didn't address in our study. You know, we talk about the, the SME branch, the merger, the descending SME branch, but there is still a gap of about 0.92 uh, seconds. And uh, one of the main challenges is, apart from the theoretical challenges, is that that frequency is very likely to be very high. <clears throat> so for that, it's possible that either you have to just wait for a very nearby event or you have to wait for the next generation detectors. But ultimately, we would like to have a complete picture like this, where you have a full connectivity from the merger through this very high frequency state of the Hadamas and the star, and then you know the black hole signal that was coming out. So that's an open question. And Procolab supernovae are of dramatic interest. Uh, this is one reason why right now we're actively looking for a signal in 2023 IXF. It happened, uh, well, it happened around May uh, 19, 18. But of course, the true T0 is a big question mark you can only find by gravitational wave observations. Uh, so you would have to go through at least one day, maybe more, in data very carefully over different frequency ranges to see if there is a, you know, at least a candidate signal that is apparent in both detectors. So we are now going through many, many pictures, spectrogram to see if there is something there. Um, we're doing it the old fashioned, we call it the Madame Curie method. We don't use machine learning. We just take our brain and then two people independently. Uh, and then, you know, slowly go through all the images without falling asleep. That's, that's the challenge actually. Okay, so, <clears throat> Where does the Zoys come into play? So we have this uh, picture where there is this gap that is missing in the detection of gravitation waves and actually also in the neutrinos. Um, but the main, one of the main messages we like to advertise is that uh, the Zoys can actually, with the objective of furthering our understanding of GRBs over very large relative range, but of course also including nearby events, that it can actually successfully collaborate 
with uh, existing generation of gravitational wave detectors, provided that you put software in place that has a sensitivity that is similar to CDC. And the key observables that will emerge in the future is uh, that I think, uh, I hope I illustrated so far, is that you pay uh, attention to the, in, in, for the unmodeled signals of the true energy and gravitational waves, which essentially sort of a calorimetric constraint on the central engine, uh, and the associated uh, frequency and gravitational waves. And when you combine it with other channels, you will inevitably have an end uh, high resolution event timing across these different energy channels. And that will be crucial in interpreting the data and in expecting uh, robust probabilities of false alarm. So I will say grazie yeah. and <laughs> happy to take some questions. So, thank you very much, Maurice. So, questions for Maurice? That's many interesting new fields. Okay, excellent. Yeah. We don't respect the gravitational wave for any GRP, but your technique for detecting gravitational waves, if I understand it correctly, is more sensitive than the ones used by other people. So did you try with some other GRP? Yeah, we did, but uh, this one was fortuitously at 40 megaparsec. We also looked at 190814 and 0425. Uh, they are at 150 and 240 megaparsec, although it was 03. But that's you know many times further than 02 than the mm -hmm. 0817. Uh, so we, I mean, actually we have. I mean, I can show you. We have images that are somewhat suggestive, but it's it's. I mean, I don't dare to present it to a larger audience other than over a cup of coffee and a cookie. It, meaning it's it's definitely showing you should be looking for the next one with 04, uh, hopefully up to about 100 megaparsec, and you have a good chance. But anything beyond is going to be uh, a little bit hands off. I mean, it's just too faint. You can increase the limit, so. Yeah, of course, we could. We oh. could. No, 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 definitely. Definitely. Okay. So you mentioned one case, uh, the possibility that uh, after the measure we are on the call of solving everything, so you don't expect that you. Yeah, 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 yeah. But actually, there have been, uh, if I'm not wrong, at least one or two possible gravitational waves for the to converge without a GRB. Is this correct? Huh? Without observer. Without observer GRB. Yeah, but this may be. Yeah, yeah, it may be pointing in the wrong direction. So, so not be, seeing a GRB is not, not sufficient. So yeah, that's a, that's a well. That, that's one of the challenges. How do you break the, this uncertainty? I mean, yeah. we, we were just very lucky because it was nearby enough that you could see it off axis. If it is more distant, you have to see it somewhat more on axis. The probability goes down, or there are more events. Uh, I, I don't have any. I mean, your your answers are so there is no way analyzing those signals, or did you look at those signals and those data? I mean, getting the, the orientation, the getting the orientation out of your gravitational wave signal is it's not easy. Okay, so I would also like to remark about this use uh, that uh, its capability will extend uh, as as they extend to very high gamma inverse because they will, get, will be able to catch very soft gamma inverse very cheaply. It will also be capable of the, the extending the opaque space mm -hmm. with respect. Uh, to these events. So, for instance, the GDM on board Fermi, which is limited to about 10 degree for the GRB detection, would detect uh, as a weak soft event, which is one of the fact that this usually can go much more fast since we detect the event. Yeah, so you see, you see it anymore. Yeah, this is nothing important. So, I see. So, basically, your event statistics yeah, will increase. be extended yeah. in the lower energy. Yeah, that's, a, that's extremely useful, of course. Yeah. We will be able to detect much more parts. Yeah, that's a very important element. This is a particular bit of the work. Ruben, oh, maybe a very nice question, but I don't know. Uh, in the case of, of uh, GRB event, you know, we have to, to do with a very polymetric level concerning to the electromagnetic wave. But when you form the, the black hole, or anyway, when you have the gravitational wave events, uh, which is the degree of uh, 
asymmetry uh, mm -hmm. with respect to to everything. I mean, uh, the implication in terms of possibility of detection, but this is very very basic, nothing to do with the detection or whatever. It's a fundamental question about the gravitational wave. Uh, how much the the gravitational wave events are some kind of asymmetry which uh, make it more likely to be detected in one direction or in another uh, with respect to a jet in a uh, in, uh, gravitational wave. This is very, very... Yeah, the, the, you can do a canonical estimate. Uh, as you know, already prior to this, the work by Woodley and many others suggested from basic arguments that your porous mass relative to your black hole mass for these solar mass type telescopic events should be about 1%. So imagine you take 10% of that into a mass in homogeneity, then you will get basically a mass ratio of delta n over m of about 0.1%. And for a typical solar mass type object, that will give you 10 to 51 nodes per second in the division way. Mm -hmm. So we, we went earlier to many such scenarios 20 years ago. And, and the question is, do you somehow heat up the torus sufficiently for that instability to set in? What is interesting is that, so the answer is yes, if you read it up to one to two MeV, uh, that we did in a very detailed calculation, becomes a couple of the of unstable. We extended that work to finite aspect ratio of chloride, with the original word of the Supremo, which is for infinitely standard order. But what is interesting is that your properties are uh, saturating at some finite delta M based on cooling in gravitational wave emission. Because you put a lot of energy in, then there are three main energy channels with, to which you're losing energy. One is magnetic winds, of course, that's the least. Then you have the free emission that's intermediate. And then you have gravitational wave emission. So that, those three channels provide cooling, gravitational wave emission, most, mostly so. So presumably you get a, a balance between energy putting in sufficient for instability and then cooling that then stabilizes the energy. But if you stick in 0.1% at a canonical scale, you get the luminosities that are consistent with what we see here. Okay, but the result in uh, the isotropy of the gravitational wave. Oh, is it, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Even more, it's isotropic, as you know, it's not perfectly isotropic because so if you, you look, look at it on this, it's circularly polarized. You look at this, it's linearly polarized. So then the luminosity varies by energy, I forgot something like 1.7 or 2 ish. It's very modest. Yes, there is an anisotropy. Yeah, yeah, this was my yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 it's not as dramatic. It's very non-dramatic yeah. compared to the GRB. Uh, yes, yes, it's yes. very non-dramatic. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So we usually take spherical averages over whole angle, mm -hmm. and that gives an XR correction factor. I think it's thirty five. I have to look at in the literature. Mm -hmm. It's worked out a long time ago, of course, but... because it all it, it's the same for for binary yeah. origin. Okay. Uh, two, maybe we can first. Um, the, uh, you show about the, the search for the descent, the shedding phase for uh, the Well, we didn't really search for it. Okay. We just shockingly encountered it by chance. Seriously. I, I, can, I can elaborate on this. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, then uh, this, uh, so I have a question. You also have to explain what you mean. <laughs> Uh, by chance. There are also two candidates that were started going for a member at the beginning of 2020, 2001, 5, and I don't remember the other one. You also search for them? Uh, uh, now that you know that maybe this is the sending part of the existence. Well, I, I remember actually prior, uh, I remember looking very, uh, I made a lot of investment in uh, 1908 yeah. uh doing my own. Uh, sensitivity distance estimate, even on the merger, I got the same as CDC. But I did that a few years ago, and then I realized, oh, I should pick up my independent H1L1 analysis. And that was more work than I expected. Oh, okay. So I left that as an aside. Uh, and we also did look at 0425. That's all we looked at. Yes. Yeah, I did, the, I, I did look years ago at pure black hole, black hole mergers. Mm -hmm. And I didn't find anything, of course, mm -hmm. more than that. So I, I went through several, but I cannot say I went through all yeah, versions. One case, sure, but maybe two. Another yeah, but it tends to be very far. I mean, yeah. if I see that this is still on the same I already, I mean, I'm, I'm getting up. I don't, I don't remember distances of these two. Uh, the beginning. 
Most of them are quite far. Then I have another question. You showed that it is high, probably, as you mentioned yeah. before. Right? But I, I'm not sure I completely uh, understood this histogram. Uh, the, the, the blue and the, the blue and uh, yeah, the blue bar and the magenta bar refer to the SD. No, not this one. Oh, this so makes sense then. You mean this so one? This one, yes. Yeah. So what does different do mean? Yeah, it's a very complicated graph. I mean, you're asking me what, what's in the legend that belongs to this figure. Yeah. Uh, it's in our paper. Um, but um, <laughs> we made a, actually we put a lot of effort in this table and it has to do with the various degrees uh, at which you're looking at joint operation. The simplest form of joint operation is you, you download the frames from LIGO and they have some data. I mean, frames actually exist. And actually many of them can be zero, which means there's not real data. And then you look at how many of them are by, by time. We choose W8, so eight second segments. How many segments percentage wise are actually filled with non zero data? We don't look at quality, so that's another column. And then you look at, you know, how many, at least, at least one of them has high quality data. That's also another column. So that's the which one I forgot. And then there is when both of them are doing very, very good. That's the, the darkest one, the most important for us. I mean, if you already know what signal you're looking for, maybe you can get by using one detector, although I still think that's a little risky in this stage of the game. Uh, but we certainly insist on both of them having work, have to be working perfectly. For instance, you're looking for a signal from a supernova. There's, there's no way you can sell whatever you find. Oh, I, uh, I saw it in H1, but sorry, I didn't see it in L1. Right. I mean, it's not responsible to, to, to sell it. There are too many earthquakes and other things, and so you need both of them. So this is geared towards what does it take for the instrument to operate to, to do a first time discovery of an unknown instrument. That's a very strong requirement. Mm -hmm. Now I get why they think the average for less of seventy five, which is like the top. Of the yeah, it sounds cars, yeah. And, yeah. and so okay. the third question was, what do you mean by making found that it's a new phase by chance? Well, sir, I, I, I gave a talk in uh, January 2018 at the Celtic, took a group meeting, and I, I just did raw data. I was just making a figure for a review paper. So actually, if you don't like in the data, you can see the nice merger, but it, the background is very non-smooth, <coughs> very jittery. So it's, if you like, uh, the texture doesn't look very nice. I mean, I'm just showing you. Know, it's actually covered. Uh, then uh, Jonah Connor asked, well, did you see anything more? And I was a bit surprised by the meaning, by the question. Like, what do you mean more? This is all I, I had. And then he asked, did you do white? No, I didn't want to touch the data. I don't know enough about the detector and stuff like that. No, no, so we should use white. Okay, so I went back to Korea. And I'm like, what did you mean by white? <laughs> so I did some whitening my way, which turned out to be fine. Uh, and then I, I saw something. Don't tell me, was this I searched for something? No, I just, no, uh, just tried to do proper housekeeping. So it's cool. Okay. In any case, in this figure, it would be nice if you put also the meaning of the columns. No, no, no. Oh, in the figure itself. Well, we have it in the caption, of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's how much text do you want to put in a figure? It's always uh... <laughs> better to include the caption in this line. I thought that by adding uh, Lorenzo's name to the table, it was already uh, <laughs> covered. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Okay, so just let me ask uh, if we say more, one more word about the possible use of this combination of average number signals and uh, electromagnetic signals for the model, you know, for uh, as we were discussing. Yeah, yeah. Then. So the, the standard way is that you by modeling the, the average number signal, you get the distance to the source. Yeah. You know, if, the if you understand your detector well, if you understand the then well, yes, that's what right. same principle. Yeah. Uh, from the electromagnetic follow up, you find direction if you uh, get lucky. So you have a perfect, uh, uh, it can be done after a yeah. diagram, you have a yeah. perfect standard. Kind of On paper, standard. it sounds good. Yeah. On paper, it sounds good. 
So you, you will discuss yesterday that there is a way of improving this. Uh, what is your view? I mean, uh, on this perspective, uh, is this reliable? Uh, what are the, the weaknesses and possible improvements? Uh, well, it depends. A bit. What what is it you're after with your cosmological measurement? I mean, typically people say let's measure H naught, right? But I mean, ultimately the scope of our study is much bigger. Are we really looking at lambda CDM or not? That's not the same question, because for that, say you address this, especially in late time cosmology, you need not only H naught, you need at least two parameters. So like H naught and Q naught, for instance. Of course, H naught is already a headache to measure, Q naught is a double headache to measure. So um, you would like to have a way to capture Q naught by perhaps a technique that doesn't measure it directly as the formula suggests. Taking a second derivative, effectively, effectively a third derivative of A. So, uh, an alternative to this, for instance, there are many, we talked a little bit about it during the Euclid meeting, you know, maybe using DAO and this amazing power of Euclid by getting really, literally billions of galaxies up to the redshift range from zero to two. Uh, but that, that, that's a bit technical. But a, another approach would be also to the Zoys. Suppose you have your favorite formula for cosmology, MCDM or something else. Then you do have a, 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 a by asymptotic extension, you will have the relationship in, in high Z between your usually omega n and your h at high Z. So if you are able to use the Zoys for making or measuring h. Independently at high Z, you can combine it with a low Z measurement. And then you have a two point measurement that also gives you, within a certain choice of background, a Q naught or an omega n, given the formula is going to be the same. So either you do a low or higher derivative measurement, which is tricky, or you do a two point measurement. That, that's, I think, where the results may come into play. So this may be the main strength of GRB in this. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, it's, well, it's a possibility general. that should be looked at. Yes. Other questions? So otherwise, thanks. You can hear me. Ah, there are questions on no, 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 no questions. Okay. No. Otherwise, someone else has a question? I said that no. I was no, you too. Christian, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Hi, Maurice. Nice talk. Uh, very, very interesting, very stimulating. I was wondering, uh, when you showed your table four of your recent paper with Lorenzo, uh, about FRBs. So if I got it right, uh, you admit the possibility that uh, one of FRBs could be due to, yes, black hole swallowing and need to start as a whole. So I was wondering whether uh, you searched because now with with the Chime catalog, there are plenty of FRBs which are relatively nearby, given that they have a low dispersion measure. So I was wondering whether you searched for the FRBs that were uh, during which the, the the interferometers were switched on, and whether you plan yeah, to do we, it. We did not uh, pursue this by actual analysis ourselves, actually partly because right now we are focused on 2023 IXF. Uh, but still, to check the uh, non-existence of anything in gravitational waves afterwards, right, it would still have to be quite nearby. Yeah, but there are some of them, they have a, a dispersion measure compatible within a few megaparsec or tens megaparsec. Oh. So relatively nearby. Then, yeah, then we should look at it. I'm sorry, I was not aware of that. Yeah, and most of them are one-off FLBs, so yeah. we do in principle compatible right. with it. That's right. That's a good point. Yeah, that sounds like uh, it, it deserves a follow-up. Mm -hmm. So then even a non-detection is interesting. Okay, thank you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so thank you very much again, Maurice. Yeah. Just in case, because I reviewed the... Uh...